well, I suppose it's a it's a cliche, really, isn't it? But you know, war is hell. You know, to to really show that. I mean, I was very inspired by the sort of thing that Harvey Kurtzman did in his war comics, or later Archie Goodwin did in in Blazing Combat, where you could tell an exciting war story, um, but not glorify war. You know, to say, well, these are the things that happen. These are people driven to their limits. Uh, it's not really fun. It's desperate. You know, like that. But of course, it's always very difficult dealing with that subject to. I mean, I forget who it was, but it has been said it is impossible to make a war movie that is anti-war because there is something inherently glamorous, particularly, it seems, to boys uh, in the notion of big explosions and massive, unstoppable bits of equipment and, and, uh, and things like this. There's a certain element of, of magic almost to it, I think, killing at a distance um, and things like that. I've heard that the original Rogue Trooper had an unusual beginning. Where did it come from? Um, they did a poll of the readers to say what sort of story would you like to see in 2000 AD and they said well we'd like something set in the future where people are killing each other which uh, you know seems an entertaining thing um, so in, unusually it was a thing that was really led by the readers um, I went away with the editor and the writer and we kicked a few ideas around and eventually came up with this idea of a person who could live in a in the hell of war this was his environment to be honest, a lot of the, uh, the emotional um, factors weren't really explored in the original stories, but I had this notion anyway of, of somebody who, um, whose fate was only to be able to exist in war, that he really couldn't function outside, that if he tried to go into normal society, he'd be like a, a berserker or a, a mad dog. And, uh, you know, I was spurred by those, or inspired by those stories of, you know, people coming back from Vietnam who, uh, you know, arrive home and go to bed and their mum comes in the next morning and wiggles their toe to wake them up with a cup of coffee and the next thing they know she's pinned against the wall you know um, in fear of her life and I wanted to get that kind of feeling into it I wasn't really able to get that in the first time around and I was really a little unhappy with uh, the direction it took but uh, of course some years later I got the chance to write it um, and get a few more of these elements in um, and to drop a few of the things that I didn't like but unfortunately I suspect that the things that I didn't like were the things that the readers really did like you know he, he had these things called biochips which were uh, like the souls of his dead comrades captured on micro circuits and one of them lived in his backpack it got its power from his backpack the other one got its power from its helmet and the other one from his gun um, but I thought it was a kind of a dumb idea because really the backpack had more personality than the guy wearing it but the readers seemed to like that, so I guess really what they wanted was, you know, people killing each other in a future setting and talking to their possessions, so there you go. After Vietnam, war comics fell out of fashion. In the past few years, though, there's been a bit of a revival, and I think the sophistication puts a lot of science fiction to shame. Marvel is currently publishing The Nam. DC just published George Pratt's Enemy Ace. The wonderful graphic novel To the Heart of the Storm is Will Eisner's moving autobiography on the eve of World War II. The Nazi concentration camps are explored in Art Spiegelman's deeply heartfelt comic, Mouse. The second volume is out now. And Eclipse Comics are publishing real war stories. Nancy, scan your archives for Joyce Bradner. I hope you didn't tape over her. Real War Stories was the first of the series that we ever did. Um, and issue number one was done with the participation of an organization uh, that's a military and draft counseling organization with an office in Philadelphia uh, called the Central Committee for Conscientious Objectors, or CCCL, probably responsible for an awful lot of people who are living in Toronto now. Uh, but they, since we, in the US we don't have an active draft right now, um, one of the things that they do that's very important is go around to schools and they have uh, Vietnam era vets, refugees from countries like El Salvador talk about what's going on. And they found that they couldn't really compete with, against the really glossy kind of media packages that the U.S. Defense Department, you know, was sending out. I mean, the U.S. Defense Department has a bigger budget, advertising budget than any corporation in the world. I mean, they're bigger than, you know, Coca-Cola. Um, and we decided to put some of the stories in a comic book form um, because it was affordable. I knew a lot of comic book artists and writers who would work on that. And the rules were pretty simple, that we would do them in a nonfiction way, told exactly the way they were told to us. And uh, that first book, uh, I think we've had like 95,000 copies have gone out so far. And it also had the distinction of being pulled into a federal court 
in Atlanta, Georgia, because it was considered to be a threat to national security. And they sent a spokesman from the Pentagon in to sit on the stand, and he pulled it out and read it and put it on his lap and said that we'd made things up. But since we had military and naval court records to back up what we were saying, and he had apparently not read any of these things, he was proven wrong, and the book was you know, allowed to get into the high schools. Real War Stories honestly illustrates veterans' experiences in the horror of war. Vietnam veterans are writing science fiction, too. Joe Haldeman captured the confusion, futility, and horror of combat in his novel, The Forever War. And former Army nurse Elizabeth Ann Scarborough wrote the award-winning The Healer's War. The horror of Vietnam is suited to horror fiction. Peter Straub's novel, Coco, deals with a Vietnam veteran who has to overcome the grief of his war experiences. The kind of uh, experiences that people in combat have change them forever. Uh, they are awakened, in a sense, but in a, in a way that can be perceived as destructive. Uh, it seems to me it can be destructive. Uh, one must uh, maintain one's own integrity, uh, and, and control. You have to continue to live in the world in an effective, moral, uh, balanced manner. Uh, and if you can do that, then you simply know more after, after having lived through uh, uh, a traumatic experience of one kind or another. But uh, I, I, do not, uh, I do not celebrate the military spirits, and, uh, and I think we should always try to do almost anything to, to avoid war. I think the most powerful scene in the book was when your protagonist, Michael Poole, visited the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington. I, I know you've been to see it as well. What was that experience like? I went with my brother who, who had been in Vietnam uh, and had, had been in combat. I'd uh, seen pictures of it and I, I thought I knew what to expect. But I didn't know was how powerful it was and how, how much like visible grief the monument was. It seemed to me to be full of dignity and a kind of music. Uh, I thought it was the best thing we'd ever done in that way, the best possible memorial to a war. That is, it seemed to me to, to do honor to the people who had been killed and to the emotions that we still had for them. Um, I thought it was really beautiful. I stood in front of it, and the thing seemed to get bigger. It stepped forward. Uh, you see yourself in it. And I cried. Uh, I, I looked at all the little things that people place there for the, the people they've lost, the little flowers, the pictures, the poems, uh, and all of that just enhances it. Uh, it's an extraordinary piece of work. There are 58,000 names on the Vietnam Memorial, and yet worldwide defense spending continues at $2 million a minute. Yeah, I know nuclear weapons are being scrapped, but not many and only because they can't be used. When the meek inherit the earth, will there be anything left? It's strange and sort of sad to me that science fiction can imagine so many possibilities, but has so much trouble imagining a future without war. Next week on Second Nature, a farmer develops a new, sweeter, juicier strain of apple. The Pentagon works to turn this breakthrough into a weapon. Also, psychics and mind readers, don't they know how much we hate them? <laughs> oh, enemy target, there it is. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Look out, look out, look out. Come around, come around, look out. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Cosmetic surgery is associated with the rich and famous.